this is Lady Maya. Hello, you guys. We are with Mr. Mark Lee. Um, he is into entertainment alongside me. <laughs> and so I just want you guys to know he's very interesting, very lovable. He's squishy. Okay, anyway, no, um, <laughs> he is a radio broadcaster. Um, and I mean, he's, he's a load of fun. So he's joining me with Lady Maya today. And I only hope you guys get to enjoy and get to know him as well as I do. So without further ado, my Mayan tribe, please welcome Mr. Mark Lee. How are you doing, Maya? Being lovely as always. I don't know that I've ever been called squishy before. I mean, I was at home recently and my mom was saying, hey, you know, you might want to lose just a little bit of that weight. Not a lot, but you might want to lose a little bit. So I'm sitting there going like, squishy? Don't know if I want to be squishy, but <laughs> You're squishy, I guess okay. But yes, squishy is a thing and all of that. And of course, you know, I haven't been to see the uh, barber song about two or three weeks ago. I now might be doing a little bit of that Santa Claus look as well, but that's okay. The barber will see me later on and it'll be less Santa Clausy and all of it. But still, <laughs> it's always great Santa to Claus. see you. Let, let's, let's keep him. <laughs> it's always great seeing you, Maya. It's always amazing seeing you. You just have so much energy and fun and you're just like a joy and all of that. So definitely it is great to be here and to be able to talk to the Mayan tribe. You know, there's those whole Mayans that are over there in South America. And I think that you may be secretly related to them, but you don't oh, know it yet. <laughs> that is so much fun though. I, I love it. Um, so let me ask you this, right? Yes. With, with you being a broadcasting personality as well, what like, when did you start? I and started. How the, is it going? <laughs> it's going well. I love doing it. I started when I was a preteen. As y'all can tell, I'm not a preteen now. I'm in my late 50s. We'll hit the big six zero next July and all of that. Okay. But my parents, when I was maybe around the age of my nephews, because they are 12 and 13. So I'm thinking around 76, 77, um, around that time, was around the time that I was that age as well so the age of my nephews and my parents were sitting there going like there used to be a jazz radio station here in this area it's no longer on the air there's not a lot of jazz going on and there's not a lot of people talking about our issues meaning african-american issues rural issues things along those lines what can we do and they said hey let's start a radio station now i want you to remember that neither mom nor dad had any training in radio. Mom was a guidance counselor. Dad had been doing stuff in civil rights. He had worked or been in the Air Force. He had definitely done things in other fields, but neither had done anything in radio. But they were like, hey, let's give it a shot anyway. Let's start our own radio station. So they applied to the FCC, got the license. I want to say that they were one of the few stations not connected to a university. You know, if you think about uh, jazz stations, you think about things like Howard, you think about things like um, definitely uh, UNC, which is more of a classical station. And there might be some other ones around the nation and the country, but they're usually affiliated with a university. And we were actually just talking about this on Thanksgiving. Mom did agree with me that it was uh, not that many stations. I think there was one that was um, some stations that are part of the Pacifica network out in LA that might've been independent. I think she said there might've been one in Georgia it was independent, but none of them really had that rural slash African-American kind of background and things of that nature. So most of the universities have stations and they are definitely usually um, community based. So they may have community DJs in addition to the student DJs, but there was nothing like our station. And the station lasted for about uh, somewhere around 12 years or something like that. But it was there in a little small rural town called Warrington. So it was right there in Warrington, North Carolina, which is near the Virginia border. So that's where um, we got our radio station going. My brother, who I just mentioned to you earlier, sometimes he likes to tease me because I got the um, I guess the fame and the notoriety from being a DJ, even on my parents' radio station, and from doing everything from a show called Feature, where we would feature an artist, and we, I think that show was about 30 minutes long, and we would feature either an individual or sometimes a group or whatever, and then there was like some blues shows, a jazz show, 
friends of mine did a show called Let's Rap, which is in the early days of hip hop. And from that, they um, some of them went on to actually commercial radio stations. But what Malik likes to remind me of is that when it came to actually, you know, picking up a hammer, picking up a nail, actually doing the building of the station, not me, him, not me. <laughs> not doing picking up the nail, not picking up the hammer. But you know, once we got into the whole celebrity aspect or doing it on the air, yes, me, not him. But <laughs> like all me. Definitely uh, uh, not picking up the nail, not picking up the nail. Not, so he actually did the physical building of the station and all of that. So like I said, he's got me on a couple of things like that because he also, I think I mentioned to you earlier when we were doing the pre-interview that he is a great cook, not as much me. I do know how to, you know, bowl a, bowl a hot dog, bowl some eggs, definitely know how to follow instructions. So if the instructions are on the package, I know what to do. But Malik is more of an experimental cook and all of that. And I do remember that when he was a youngster, I've always been an avid reader, partially because of my grandmother, but uh, definitely being an avid reader, I remember definitely, I think he crawled up on it to the oven at our parents' house and he picked up the cookbook and I think he handed it to me and basically told me to read it to him while he fixed the dish. I don't remember what the dish was. I just remember, I think it was good. So whatever he fixed, it must have been good. And he's been steady cooking ever since that. So he's definitely an experimental cook and a good cook in that regards. But I'm still a reader, still involved in reading. But I do remember literally him, and there's a seven year gap between us. So he must have been, let's say four or five, and I was probably like 12. And he was like handing me the cookbook and saying, hey, read me the cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> he knew it, he knew it before you did, huh? <laughs> like, That's oh, right. This is what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I wish I had a story like that. No, 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 I had no idea what I wanted to do, <laughs> everyone. So, you know, well, well, what well, I'm yeah. doing now, oh my God. I never what? knew I could even do things like that. Well, I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I knew that even at a young age that I wanted to be a journalist because, you know, the time I was coming up was the time of Watergate, Richard Nixon and that whole nightmare and everything. So I did know that I wanted to be an investigative reporter at a relatively young age. So that's something that I knew I wanted to get involved in. And then I read a book by Hunter S. Thompson, who did the whole Fear and Lothian uh, series, Fear and Lothian at the Kentucky Derby, Fear and Lothian at the, um, I think it was Las Vegas, Fear and Lothian in Las Vegas, I think is the full title. But I knew that I might want to get into investigative reporting and in some cases what they call gonzo journalism, where you literally get into the uh, space and actually immerse yourself into whatever the story is about. Like I know that in the Kentucky Derby, um, Hunter S. Thompson actually went to the Kentucky Derby and spent his time there just enjoying the entire experience and then reported on it. And the same with his experience in Las Vegas. And I think there might be one or two other books in that series. So I didn't know that I wanted to go into that field. But before that, and I think I even ran off a mimeograph newspaper. I might have run off a couple of copies. So I even ran off my own edition of a newspaper complete with, I think, a weather report and some other things. So I don't know if mom or dad still have copies of my old mimeograph newspapers from when I was a youngster. Dad does collect stuff and uh, mom does too as well. So I don't know if they've got them. I'm gonna have to ask them the next time I see them if they've still got those items. But I originally thought one of the fields that I thought I wanted to go into was I thought I wanted to be a um, weatherman, a meteorologist. I remember getting like the whole barometer and getting like the farmer's almanac and studying the weather and trying to figure out what I was gonna do in that weather sense. And I think I had almost as much accuracy as the actual weatherman, because you know, the weathermen aren't always that accurate. So I think I had almost as much accuracy as they did. But um, in hindsight, I probably could have still done it. But at the time I was thinking to myself, that means that you're going to have to take science courses, hmm. which means you're probably going to have to take some biology courses. And I just remember that as a youngster, when I had to do that whole thing about dissecting a frog, wasn't really feeling it. So after that, everything that was science related went out the door. I'm like, that I got to take science related courses where I've got to cut up things. I'm not really going to go for that. So that kind of like killed all the science fields. You know, as I've gotten older, I've learned that there is a difference between earth sciences and some of the more uh, like biology type sciences and things of that nature. But at the time, science was science. So I was like, I've got to cut up something, not really feeling it. So 
that kind of got me into journalism. So I went to the lovely University of Marquette, which has now only lost one game. So we were actually doing better than we thought that we were going to do under the leadership of Shaka Smart, our new coach and everything. So we'll find out if we're for real or not when we play Wisconsin on the 4th. But I went there and thoroughly enjoyed that experience, even though hey, uh, my, you know, it was kind of shocking going out there to the uh, Midwest and realizing that there was this thing called snow. It came regularly, because like I said, in Warrington, we had snow. The schools would literally um, cancel, like you go, you turn on your TV, they still do it today. And they go through the whole, they go through the whole letters and then, you know, Warrington's way down there in the W. So you mm-hmm. finally they'd be like, Warrington school is closed. I'm like, good, school closed. You know, looked outside, it might have been some snow. Out there are snow falling. And I remember a couple of times saying, good, school's closed. No school. I'm liking this idea. Yeah. Going back to sleep. Yeah. Waking that, up I later. That was everybody's idea, too. It was yeah. like, oh, it is? Uh, we weren't really oh, that awake <laughs> like early in the morning. So my mom would tell us. Like, oh, yes, so your school's remember, closed. I'm going to work. Bye. <laughs> yeah. And then you go back to sleep. But weren't you disappointed yeah. a couple of times? At least when we were in Warrington when you woke up and then you looked outside and you were like, I know that mom and dad told me there was snow. Right. I don't see any snow. Where'd the snow go? Because like I said, it would be sometimes those like quick snowstorms that it snow didn't stick. But because of it being slippery or because of ice or different other things, they would call the classes, but when you looked outside, it was like, there was no snow. So you were a little bit, dis- you were disappointed. You didn't even get to sled or do anything. <laughs> get to sled. Do. And then you were like, you know, it's like, I knew I should have woken up maybe at 11 o'clock instead of 12 or 12.30, because now that I've woken up, the snow is gone. There is no snow. But gone. that was not the problem when I went to Milwaukee, because Milwaukee has real snow and they have lots of snow. I rem- The story I remember about Milwaukee snow is there was a blizzard. And I just told you that in Warrington, if there was even a slight hint of a blizzard, there was no school. Mm. But, you know, Milwaukee, Chicago, Ohio, they don't believe in that stuff. So I remember one time, they do not believe in that. I remember one time. Because they get it so often, right? It's so often. They get so often, they don't believe in it. I just remember one time, um, there was a blizzard and mom had sent me a down coat. It's like a big Mm -hmm. white down coat. And I remember we had like the closets that people could see. So like there was similar, I guess they call them like walking closets or stuff like that. But literally if you looked, you could see inside or whatever. And I just remember one time I'm in the dorm, there's a blizzard and I'm thinking to myself, wow, we ain't got no school today. And all of a sudden my friends were like, "Uh, Mark, there's still class. I'm going like, class? That's a blizzard. It can't be class. They're like, no Mark, there's a class. I'm like, can't be class. They're like, there is a class. And you need to go to your class. And then yeah. they were pointed and they said, you see that down coat your mom sent you? Mm-hmm. I'm like, uh-huh. Throw it on. Throw on your boots. Start marching. I'm like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It was like four feet of snow when I was living in Chicago. My kids still had to go to school. It was crazy. I was like, are you serious? <laughs> like, we stop in Philly. We stop at three at least, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> he said four. I was like, yeah. I was not happy about that. You were not happy at all. I wasn't happy about trenching in the snow. But I was Mm -hmm. going, I guess I got to go to class in the snow. But I did four and a half years of those winners. Four, yeah, five winners in Milwaukee. Um, My, how many times do you think I've been back to Milwaukee since that time? Since I graduated in, is it got it? None. Both have come back and been like, I'm having life events. You know, they talk about marriages. They're talking about babies. They're talking about all these other kind of events. And, you know, I'll ask them, I'll be like, so when is this event going to be? And they'll be like, you know, nine times out of 10. It's like, the event's going to be in November. No, that's okay. Oh, no. I ain't going to be there. No. I'm not going to be there. I'll see y'all later. Like, I I send my love. Yeah. (laughs) In my love, Mike said the gift, but no, nah, I can't be that. I'm sorry, not happening. No, that's too funny. Oh my goodness. But it, it makes sense. You know, I, I haven't, let me see, since I moved to Florida, I have not gone back to Philly. And so, no. I mean, yeah, no, I'm good. good. I don't ever, if I can avoid it at all costs, I would love to. Because, you know, they, they call me, where's Maya? And um, I'm one of those type of people. 
people that I'll be in a whole nother state and they'll be like, wait, what happened to? I'm like, yeah, nah, the wind blew. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here now. You're over there now. But you know, you mentioned Philly where you're from, but I told you we did Thanksgiving dinner this past Thursday and it was me, mom, my brother, my two nephews. But later on, Deanna and um, Bobby Lee came. And that's like, um, Deanna is mom's distant uh, cousin. And um, I want to say that Bobby Lee is her husband. I want to say they've been together for like 50 or 60 years. They've been together for a long time. They've been together for a very long time, but they are originally from Philly because they were talking about some of the gambling that they love doing and some of the neighborhoods that they grew up in because they actually knew the gym that Joe Frazier <laughs> was yeah. in. I was they, right down the street the, from Joe Frazier's gym. I okay. was right on Broad Street. Yep. I know. They knew that gym. They knew some of the uh, players and athletes and entertainers from that era and everything because they mentioned some of their names. Uh, the names are not coming to me right now, but they definitely grew up in that area and they definitely talked about going up there to get some of their uh, gambling off. And they still do that even if they go to some of our areas like Cherokee or Atlantic City or some of the other places. But right. they definitely Lame still have a, uh, Philly roots and those uh, Philly connections. And I think that uh, he's actually, but see, it's kind of like you. He's moved down here and everything. And now he's got horses. So I don't think that he had horses in Philly. I can't, I'm not really seeing they horses. They do have horses in Philly. They, they do. have cowboys in Philly. Yes, they do. Okay. How about that? Ain't that some bull crap? I'm like, in the city? Why? <laughs> Why? They got cowboys Why? in the city? It, it, there's cowboys in the city. Okay. Well, there's a cow. There's a whole cowboy organization here in Durham as well, though. I think they're That's called the, um, the Bull City Riders. I would get that one and the car went mixed up but i know there's a uh, motorcycle group and then there's also a um horse group and i think the horse group is called the bull city riders my brother is actually part of a club as well he's part of a you know those batmobile cars the ones that yeah, are called slingshot like yeah. yeah he's got a he's part of a club that's the bull city slinger so they're all people that got different slingshots and they've done fundraisers and different things to help people like some people that have had some problems with housing or kids that when they were not graduating, they went and gave them support and they've definitely raised uh, items that like gotten some uh, masks and some other things. So they are definitely a, um, while it may be a social club, they're a social club with just trying to do good and positive things and all of that. As a matter of fact, I think they're going to do a fundraiser for MS in the very near future and all of that. So they are very much engaged in a lot of positive work and all of that. As a matter of fact, they were talking um, as we were riding back, as I was, they were bringing me back. Malik was because he still went back to go and hang out with mom a little bit more because I had some obligations, work obligations, to take care of. But he was telling me about um, this group that's called the. They're like the dirt bike group, and apparently they're known for doing wheelies and stunts here in this neighborhood. And sometimes, uh, you know, the kids love them because they see them doing pop ups and wheelies not as much the neighbors so my brother's group wants to get them involved in the parade or some of the other things Ooh, so to see nice. that they are even though these are the younger guys because the guys in the playing the shots are usually I'd say older, middle aged or things of that nature, but definitely most of the folks in the slingshot group, I mean, the other group, the dirt bike group are younger. Of course, that's part of the reason the kids love them because they love seeing adults or what they consider to be adults, but they're young adults doing pop-ups and wheelies. Whereas, you know, the old church mamas, they're not exactly feeling they it because they're going like, <laughs> like, these people are blocking my traffic. They're blocking my trying to get where I got to right. go to. And so they want to show that these kids are actually doing positive things and not necessarily just doing it just to be uh, rambunctious or anything of that nature. So that's, what, that's some of the work that Malik does now because he works with kids in general. He works with uh, helping at-risk youth and doing things along those lines. So like I said, the cooking is more of a hobby that he and his uh, lady love. They engage in on a pretty regular basis. But in terms of work, um, he does the uh, whole thing of helping our youth that are going through different things. So what some people might have in the past called at-risk youth, even though I personally don't like those terms because there's nothing really at-risk. They just need some direction. I think that Malik is trying to give them direction give them and other people that are trying yeah. to give them direction as well. Speaking of direction, did you ever um, know or have any idea at what age that you knew 
what your um, kids, your three uh, daughters, were going to be when they grew up. Because I asked my nephews, I asked them this past weekend on Thanksgiving. I said, hey, Julius and Langston, this was toward, I think, on Thursday night or Friday. What are y'all going to do when y'all grow up? Now that I think about it, I think it was Thursday, I think it was Friday, which would have been the day after Thanksgiving. And Julius all of a sudden piped up and said, I want to be a biologist. I'm like, cool, that's a good thing. I'm not cutting up anything, but if you want to be a biologist, and actually his great grandfather, my grandfather was a biologist. The building at Central, at North Carolina Central University is named after him. So I'm thinking my dad is actually the reason he thinks about being a biologist, but I could be wrong. I'll have to ask dad if he's pushing him in that direction as this is just something he came up on his own. But Langston, the younger one, and like I said, Julius is 13 and Langston is 12. When I asked Langston, Langston looked at me like, basically gave me that look like, oh, why are you asking me these questions? I have no clue. I got plenty of time to figure it out. Why are you bothered to ask me? I don't know. If Julius thinks he knows, more power to him, but I have no clue whatsoever. So he's giving me that look like, oh no, and you need to stop asking me. <laughs> um, it was funny because like my girls, um, they had got to the point of, they were just so into the one thing that they did. So right. my oldest daughter, she she's a dancer. Okay. So she dances in um, music videos and different things like that. She's always danced, always. But we would mess with her and call her the dancing chef because she would dance in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So that was my oldest daughter. She would do that. She was about 10 or 11. Um, my middle one, all she did was draw. That's all she did. She since she was like four, she would just okay. draw. She would draw everything freehand. She didn't care. And I was just like, so what are you gonna do? She's just like, I don't know, but I'm gonna be an artist. And I said, well, all right then, be an artist. Right. Now she's in college for computer computer graphic arts. So okay. I mean, she know. Um, now the baby. She's pulling more towards um, veterinarian. Okay. To be a veterinarian. Um, she goes to a school that has a freaking uh, zoo inside of it. So The school has a zoo? Yes, it has its own zoo. Inside. I'm, I'm impressed inside the school is school. It? Yes. Mm. It's called Saw. It's one of the top schools in Pennsylvania, especially okay. in Philly. And so, I mean, they got funding out the wazoo. My daughter plays with cows all day. Because she, gets she to play does not care for people. <laughs> She's like, I can speak to the cows better than I can speak to people. And I was just like, that's fair. <laughs> so, she would have had a field day then if she had come to visit mom on Thanksgiving because we had two animal moments. I think I expressed those to you earlier, yes. but definitely we had the uh, turkeys that were walking outside. I know that when Malik was taking me home, we looked out and there had to have been a good, I want to say 10. It might have been a little bit less, but they were just strolling through mom's backyard as if to say, I okay, whew, word caught. We, we got at least a James left. Yeah. <laughs> we're good. We're good at least for a couple of weeks. I do think that they serve us on Christmas, but we're good for at least a couple of weeks. So I think <laughs> we turn around for a while before we have to go back into hiding. Before we push out. <laughs> we might go back into hiding closer to December, you know, the end of December. We might go back into hiding until the new year. Exactly. But for right now, we're just going to strut around and all of that. And then I remember Malik was watching one of the football games. It might have been the second. So I think that was the because he's a Bears fan. So I don't think it was the Bears game. I think it was the Cowboys game, which is the second game on Thanksgiving. He was watching the game and all of a sudden I heard Malik go, man, that's a big cat. And I love animals. I'm a big animal lover. I mean, I got my two neighbors above me, Astro and Louie. Notice I said Astro and Louie. I know the owners. I can't think of their names, but I know the dogs. <laughs> but I know their pets. <laughs> I, I know their pets. And, you know, every once in a while I'll come back and I'll remember it as we're talking. But definitely Astro and Louie are cool. Astro is like a collie. I think Louie might be more like a, uh, you know, one of the bigger, like, muscle dogs or something like that. I don't think it's a pit, but it definitely is more of a <laughs> muscle dog. I think it may have, like, some either bulldog or pit mixed into it, and I could be mm -hmm. wrong and everything. But definitely Astro, I think, has more of that Kali mix type to it and everything. Right. But I just remember Malik looking at the cat and all of a sudden mom was like, yeah, that's the neighborhood cat. I'm going like, neighborhood cat? What do you mean neighborhood cat? Apparently the cat just roams around the neighborhood and the cat, as Malik observed and I did observe it as well, 
the cat was not missing any meals. So the cat's doing quite well being the neighborhood cat. And it was just strolling around. And mom has had plants on her deck, on her back deck and everything. And many of those plants are empty now, which means that they're collecting rainwater. So, you know, the plant was empty. So literally the cat was on a tiny little paws and was just having like a little bit of a drink. So the cat was having, a, it, it was having a cat bar. It was having a drink at the cat bar. So cat it was bar. taking mom into the uh, cat bar and all of that. And I'm going like, man, that cat is having a lot of good fun. And yeah, mom was like, yep, that's just the neighborhood cat. So I'm thinking the cat just runs around and that's probably why it's a fairly heavy set cat. Because like I said, the cat's probably like, hey, all right, no today, I, today I'll go to Mrs. Lee's house. Tomorrow I'll go to her neighbor's house. I've got the kids and I'll go to the other house. You know, it's just roaming around. It's, yeah. it's, it's literally the if neighborhood. Only we could all do that, right? That would yeah. be easier. <laughs> but you know, we do do that. We do that on holidays. If you think about it, what do you do on holidays? I mean, we did not do it as much this year, but a lot of times on holidays, you'll, you'll get your meal. And then, you know, either somebody else will pop in wanting a share or your company and everything or you go to somebody else's house so a lot of times we do go house hopping and it's almost doing like what the cat's doing you're going from house to house going like i'll get a meal here i'll get a meal there i'll get a meal there and you know it's it's good the other thing that's really good about thanksgiving that i love and i'm still munching on some as a matter of fact i was munching on some earlier when we were doing our pre-meeting is that thanksgiving is great for leftovers i've still got leftovers yes. from mom and i love the leftovers and they Mom actually said something funny. She was like, and she gave me you know, probably a good amount. And she was like, now, um, and I was telling her, I said, mom, you do know that this will be, I'll be gone by like three or four days. Like by, uh, let's say she gave it to me on Friday. I was like, by Sunday or Monday, probably gone. She's like, she's like, I gave you enough food to like, if we had gone grocery shopping, that should last like at least several weeks or a month. I'm like, no, don't think so. <laughs> You know, you snack a little bit here, you snack there a little bit there. Don't get me wrong. I mean, and it's delicious food. So, you know, you grab some in the morning, you grab some at night. And then the next thing you look into the refrigerator and you're like, I know I had some food. I know I had lots of food. Where did it all go? And then you look at your stomach and you're like, oh, that's where it went. Okay. Well, <laughs> now, now I know where it went. <laughs> then you're like, aha, uh -huh, I get it. I understand now. Yes. I know where the food went. It went to your stomach. <laughs> went to the That's stomach horrible. but you know it's what? Horrible. It's like eating food okay sleep eating so horrible i'm i'm feeling the ramifications of my my actions <laughs> are you feeling the ramif that. you're feeling the ramifications while, while you're having some water to wash it down right uh, luckily this is like the extra aqua water so i'm like okay i'm trying to get all this bloatedness and just like okay just away just summer down now <laughs> but we started a new trend which i think we need to do right here on your show it's a new trend that uh, my friend brian has done some other friends have done it on the, their websites as well as their live streams so what we need to know right now is what is the brand what is that brand name right now of this one the water that you're drinking right now oh heck no, no i'm saying what brand is it it's on the, the bottle. Water, the water initially was great value. It's, it's called what? Great value. Watch great it. value. If you're watching and listening to the Lady Maya show, we need you to sponsor us right now. Great value. If you're listening right now, we are looking for a sponsorship. Great value. great value. If you're watching and you want to sponsor, Lady Maya will have no problem with you sponsoring the show. So right now, great value. If you are listening and you're watching, we would love you to sponsor at this moment. V8, I love V8. If you are watching, we will have a sponsorship <laughs> for V8 as well. So yeah, we've been slipping that into stuff left and right. So like I said, yes, I might even look at stuff and be like, hey, you know, Bounty, because you know, I do have mom did give me some household supplies as well. Bounty, if you're watching, Lady Maya will gladly accept the sponsorship from Bounty. So we're just slipping in sponsorships whenever we can. So yes. like I said. <laughs> as, as it comes. <laughs> Yes. That's right. So, so hopefully somebody will watch it and be like, hey, these guys keep mentioning in our names. Maybe we need to sponsor them. And right? they'll send a check. Because you're not going to argue with a check, right? Look, I do it with the hands and everything. Yeah. The hands, the whole nine yards. <laughs> the whole nine yards. So that's what we do. You got to be in there <laughs> and do all of that. Be like, hey, you want to sponsor us? You got to sponsor us right be a now. Sponsor. Yes. Be a sponsor. <laughs> um, okay. So let me ask you this. Yes. What is the name? Because I know you have several um, 
radio shows. Several Are live streams, things? one radio show, several shows that I produce. So I do a little bit of everything. Sometimes I'm trying to figure out, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for them to invent something new. And I think that you need it as well, because I've talked to you enough times that I think you need it as well. So I think that we need to send in a bill to the Congress. This is our bill. We are tired of the 24 hour day. We want 48 hour days because I think we need 48 <laughs> hours to do everything that we do in our lives. So like I said, we want 48 hours. Right? Day. <laughs> like, let's double it up. Yeah. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> It would be. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine though? I mean, we would be all lunatics. Like, like okay, so when do we sleep? I don't know. <laughs> what is this word you talk about called sleep? I'm still trying to figure out what it is. I take a nap. But what is this word called sleep? It's weird. It's just so hard to even get the rest because when you're like so engulfed in mm -hmm. what you do, it's just like you lose track of everything. Your name, your time, your responsibilities. I mean, some of them, depending on like how long your days are. It's just like, oh my goodness, I just, I can't. And if I got any, if I had another hour, I think I'd be a whole lunatic, to be no, honest. Like, no, I understand what you're saying, Maya, because I'm thinking, you know, I've got friends, I'm still in that, um, even as getting ready to hit the big six next year, I'm still in that single space. And I know that when I've talked to young ladies or been involved in the dating world, and then they see the different things that I'm doing, whether that's concerts, whether that's live streams, whether that's different shows, the general question is, do you even have time for a relationship? So that's the question I was going to turn and flip back to you, because I'm sitting there going like, I'm sure that with your kids and your husband, they're probably sitting there going like, we know that there's this woman named Maya that's in our life. We're not 100% sure <laughs> who Nobody she is. Nobody pays me that here. much attention, which is good because think about all the energy that I give you. Right. Try giving that to one man. Right. He loses his mind. He's just like, please go to work. <laughs> Isn't there something you were supposed to do? <laughs> like, so to put all that energy on him, I mean, ugh. He gets like, okay, no, I can't. I'm going to bed. <laughs> I'm going to bed. I'm taking my old man nap or whatever. He does what he does. The, the girls are grown and or away, I should say. Uh, so like, yeah, they're they're like doing their own thing. Everybody, we all live in different states, so that's a blessing. You know, I know where my kids are. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, okay, everybody's doing okay. You're doing well. I am putting all my energy into everything that I do. I talk to people. I'm networking all day. It's just madness. And then when I am tired, oh my gosh, I hit that pillow. That's it. Lights out. Oh yeah, no, I've done that. I've done that. When you hit, when when the crash comes, the crash comes strong it, and fast. You pick up and you're like, man, it's four o'clock. What time did I go to bed? gave everything so it's just like yeah i don't have no more to give <laughs> that's it that's it but i i love it like i love doing this and this has just been so much fun so much fun and, and the people that i've gotten to meet oh my gosh you and and miss betty and oh my gosh all the people the lovely people from the e-mixer um clubhouse that's yeah, club nice that's different. I'm trying to get, I'm still trying to get my hand on it. Now, what are you um, trying to get your hands on about Clubhouse? Because I've become a Clubhouse warrior, so I know a little bit about Clubhouse. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm part of a Clubhouse group. There's a we puppet group to. there called Monkey Eye Puppets, which is actually the first ever cartoon audio troupe on the internet and definitely on Clubhouse. So IPC Ooh. created that and he's got me being one of the voice actors. Voice actors, I play the role of Echo, but there are others in there playing like the role of Juniper. I think that's Robbie Kay, who's actually been nominated for a Grammy. And then there's uh, Cheryl, I can't think of Cheryl's last name, but she plays the character of Lemonade. And then there's Lise, and then there's uh, Nola out of Scotland that plays the role of Aura. 
and there are a number of other characters that I owe. Um, there is Kalichi, who I think lives in London, and he plays the role of Jacopo. So there are different folks, and we do these lovely performances. As a matter of fact, we did one last night or going into this morning because every Saturday there is an improv room. So literally people pop in, both the members of the troupe, as well as just friends and family and the total uh, strangers and we just engage in the conversations and pull them in to improv games and uh, the whole time awesome. are, oh, that's, that's one thing that goes on in Clubhouse. I'm also friends with uh, Jamie who runs a uh, company called Flintstone Media and she has several podcasts in the rooms in there so she's doing a lot of things in there and then I have become going to have to do something with that because yeah, there, I there's, a, there's a whole podcast in so connected <laughs> yeah, there's a whole podcasting club in there. There's some clubs that are around networking, like Annabella does one where she tries to give money to different people. And I've actually found some of my amazing guests through Clubhouse as well, including some that might have different views than my, than me, because there's one called Success Airlines, which is run by a gentleman by the name of Keontae, but he also has a um, co-moderator and among several moderators, but one of the moderators is um, it's like the MC Hammer song, uh, Too Legit. Too Legit MC is her name that she goes by. And uh, as she puts it, she has never been an MC, has never had any MC skills, but it is her uh, initials to her last name, which I think is like McCulley or something like that. So, and apparently MC Hammer was floating around in the clubhouse and some other people that are legitimate superstars. I know I went to a birthday party that was for Bootsy back on um, like around the weekend of October 26th. So that was actually Bootsy's uh, birthday party. So I think the 26th might have been on Tuesday because that's also my brother's birthday. And I want to say the a party for him was like on the 24th. But there are some very legitimate, very real superstars like Lisa Lisa of Lisa Lisa and Colt Jam was in there. Some people connect, connected to Atlantic Star and other groups have been in there, even some big time actors. I want to say that even Elon Musk and some others pop into Clubhouse on a come a regular basis. So it, Grant Cardone is definitely always in there. So there are some major players that are in there. Like I said, some are you have one stance or another on some of the controversial issues, whether that's the vaccines or whether that's Black Lives Matter or whether that's critical race theory. But there's some newsrooms in there. Um, there's all kinds of interesting rooms in there. So I have definitely been maneuvering my way around the clubhouse streets as a friend of mine called. Wow. Okay. No, we definitely, I'm, look, if I, if, if I got to shadow you, I will. That's not no, even a problem. Not I even a problem. Uh, because yes, I don't know. I know a lot of people that can be really, really um, vital to a lot of those rooms. I do. Right. Now, getting to those rooms and not knowing where and when is yep, yep. usually one of the harder things hmm. to kind of like. Well, the other thing that was a problem as well before, and I was just glad when they opened up about maybe five or six months ago to Android, because before that it was a strictly iPhone yeah, uh, thing. And I'm sitting there going like, nah, don't have an iPhone, got an Android. But when they opened it up to Android, I was like, okay, now I can play. Now we can do something. <laughs> now I can play. Now I get to play in the streets. I was actually in a room yesterday where I got a chance to mention my grandmother because she was, um, there was a gentleman in there that was uh, doing some work in the library field. So I had a chance to mention some of that history with grandma in uh, that particular room. And I think I mentioned to you in one of our pre-interviews or previous interviews, which is that grandma started the first black library in Raleigh and she did it even though she had the library experience. So unlike my parents who started a radio station with no experience, she definitely had the library experience, but I don't know that she had fundraising experience. So she literally walked around the streets of Raleigh knocking on doors of probably some major people as well as some minor people. I was like, hey, can I get you to donate this? Can I get you to donate that? And she raised enough money to open the first African-American library in Raleigh. I want to say that it opened in like maybe the forties or something like that. And it is still running to this day. So it was definitely going for a while and it's still got an whole entire collection dedicated to her. So there is a collection in the Richard B. Harrison Library called um, the Molly Houston Lee Connection. Um, uh, collection, I said connection, but I meant collection. But yes, she started that library and all of that. And like I said, the library is still there and still in our section of the town and all of that. So definitely, you know, that's part of the 
family legacy as well. As a matter of fact, I just looked it up. It was 1935. She started that library in 1935 with a collection of 890 books inside a small storefront at the Delaney Ions building. So it's at a different location right now, but the Richard B. Harrison Library is still in existence, a library that she started less than 100 years ago, but almost 90 years ago, back in 1935. That is amazing. Oh, wow. So you, your family got nothing but history, huh? <laughs> oh, all kinds of history. I mean, even on mom's side, her um, her mom, my grandmother was on mom's side, was a longtime school cafeteria worker, but was also very active in the, the local church, along with her husband, who was a um, farmer and a rural worker, meaning he owned his own land and things of that nature in the rural North Carolina. And I won't say he was a deacon, in the church and the church still um, honors them with, I think a plaque or something like that on, in, on the church and everything. But yes, uh, Pine Chapel is considered like a family church because we have deep roots to that church and deep history with that church. And I remember when it was located literally across the street from where grandma worked at. And now it's in a whole different location, but there was a time that it was literally across the street and definitely was interesting. I remember one time it was a popular disco called Days Disco. And I remember that as a teenager going, or maybe as a young adult in my twenties, going to that club, coming out and there was somebody having a revival outside of the club. So, you know, they were definitely talking all kinds of junk to us going into the club and literally it was like next door to the church that was the more traditional church. But this was like one of them revival type churches and you step it out and I think they were like, you know, you don't need to be going in there. That place is bad for you. And all this kind of stuff. We look at them like, look, we just want to get our dance on. Can, can you chill? We young folks, we just want to get our dance on. Shake a groove thing. Yeah. So we just want to shake that little thing. We're not really trying to hear y'all right now. <laughs> can we save no. that for? <laughs> like shush, talk to the hand. Okay, we just want to go in there, our dance groove on. <laughs> right? Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Look at you. Okay, so the library, mm -hmm. the first, and the radio show. Yep. And oh, that's right. You did ask me that radio shows and what I do in that arena. I had started off with international broadcast media, but well, actually it started off when I was doing radio, both for my parents' radio station, as well as uh, WMUR, which is the radio station at Marquette, and then eventually at Central. I did do some work at Central's radio station when it started and had a blue show over there. But the more recent history is about during this whole pandemic, there was a group of folks, Nick Palveda, Kim Calhoun, and others that were like, they had heard about this, you know, virus coming from other parts of the world before it got to the United States. So they were like, we need to cover this. We need to cover it and make a whole network that talks about it. So that's when they created international broadcast media. And then they were like, we need other shows. So they had a show called Podcaster Thursday or something like that. And they invited me to be a guest on that. I was a guest several times and they were like, hey, we like you. We like you a lot. How about you do a show for us? I was like, okay. I can do one show. I forgot, I'm not doing that much else. I mean, measurement's kind of on shutdown. That's the test grading company that I work for. Hey, Ty's on shutdown. I ain't got much else to do. Sure, I can do one show. So I was like, I'll do one show. And so they were like, oh good, we'll give you a title for the show. And that's when they came up with radio show with Mark Lee, which is the show that they created in terms of its title. You know, all the guests and everything else, it's all my mastermind and my ideas and everything, but the title was theirs and they created a commercial for it, which is the one commercial that still airs. And then they were like, after a while, they were like, hey, would you like to do maybe some more shows? I was like, okay, how about two on Monday? I was like, sure, I can do two on Monday. So that's when I created Mullins Music and Memories. All these shows are very similar in the sense that they're about creatives, entrepreneurs, activists, educators, and maybe one or two other categories. But those are like the four, primary categories of people that are on the show and all of that. So I was like, sure, I can do Mullen music and memories. Maybe you can bring up some of my past memories and some of my past music. They were like, cool. And then after that, I created the Wednesday online dinner party. And I was like, okay, so I can do the online dinner party. And that's where I created like some uh, shows that have little uh, things that go with them. Like there's a trivia contest where I might give you some trivia questions and then a uh, celebrity picture will pop up. It might be a historical person like Dillinger or, um, you know, maybe one of the 
Indians from back in the day, Native Americans from back in the day, or it might be like somebody from a foreign country, or it might be like a celebrity that everybody knows, like Shakira or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or somebody like that. But there's questions that are going across, and it's basically a trivia contest. So far, people have not been doing well. I did have at least a couple of winners, and I've given them a couple of prizes. One of the prizes still has to go out and everything of that nature. So I created the online dinner party, which I love that title, and people love popping in on that show on a regular basis. And now there's a music segment as well. So in the music segment, anybody can send in their, it's not even music, whatever their talent is. It can be music, it can be a ventriloquism act. I don't care, as long as it's in MP4. And that's like our little talent section that is the latest addition to the online dinner party and things of that nature. And guess what, Maya? After I did that, they were like, this is amazing. You know people too. How about you get them to do shows for us? And I was like, okay. So that's when I got the Gamers Den on, uh, which is my friend Jatobi's show. I got Zach on. I got Plant a Seed on. Plant a Seed went on hiatus. I don't know if it's going to come back to the network in May. Zach took his show to his own network, Nine on the Grind, which I still help him. He produced his show, which is what I did yesterday and everything. And then uh, Barbara H. Smith came on because I did a live stream Black Business Expo for my friend Eric Kelly. And he helped me recruit some people like Barbara H. Smith, uh, Maxine Walters, Maxine, sorry, Maxine Phillips McCoy, um, who uh, does a show and her show is Life Strategies. Barbara is about business because she's a business coach. Um, then there's Billy Graham Jr., not the um, famous evangelist, but another Billy Graham who's a guy out of Houston that does a coach, a show around positivity and being your living your positive life. And then um, LA Bachelor, who is not connected with um, Eric, does a show which is around politics, social justice, and sometimes it'll also go into sports and things of that nature. And then last but not least, sometimes people will do shows or I'll create an idea for a show with them. And then they'll like leave the show and then I get stuck with, it, which is kind of what happened with the fantasy football show. Because I now do a fantasy football show. It was originally supposed to be done with my friend Terry Good, but I think work and other things got in his way. So I'm looking for a co-host for that as well. And maybe Terry will come back. But And plus the fantasy football season is almost over, but we are doing a sports show regularly on Tuesday. I remember which day that was. That's on Tuesday evening and all of that. And then we just launched a new show. And there's some other new shows that we're in the process of talking to, but the new show that we just launched is uh, Pinks and Blues, which is a young lady entrepreneur who's talking about what it's like to be a woman entrepreneur because she came out of the construction field. She actually had her own construction company and she's done real estate and building of houses and all of that. So she has now done her first two shows and we are glad to have the Pinks and Blues show with Tracy uh, Mebbin on. Oh, and I forgot Coco. Coco is an amazing artist. She actually was with Gerald LaVert. She was one of Gerald LaVert's background singers and she has the Coco McMillan show on Thursday. So that show is on Thursdays and she's had all kinds of amazing musicians, including the woman, the Shirley Murdoch that sang As We Lay and she's had some other national and uh, international artists because she actually is business partners with a young lady out of Morocco. So she had that lady come on to the show all the way from Morocco and they are business partners with a club there in Morocco. So we've had all kinds of amazing guests on not just my show, but the different shows that I help produce. Nice, wow. You guys got a whole lot going on right there. And so we've got all it. kinds of things going. But see, huh? all your stuff is really fun. You know, yes. I like the fun stuff. <laughs> I like the other stuff. Let's let's enjoy our time. Right. What we do have because like that's so important. But every you know everybody has that dull moment where it's just like, huh, I'm gonna have to learn something or I have to do you know something like that. And some oh, people, don't get it wrong. We were, yeah, don't get it wrong. We were just talking about that on my friend Brian Shulman, who is a LinkedIn influencer, and I actually come on his show pretty regularly on Wednesdays and Saturdays and I pop in as a guest. Don't have to do any producing, just pop in as a guest, even though I'm helping him organize his anniversary for March along with one of the other people, Veronica. Um, yeah, Veronica Jean, who is a Shopify queen, but we are helping him organize his celebration of five years of doing this one show that he's been doing for um, actually five years of his company, Voice Your Vibe. So I think it's the five year celebration of Voice Your Vibe and all of that. But we're doing that on a regular basis. But we were talking about burnout because there can be burnout and there are, can be moments where you're sitting there going like, I don't really feel like doing this. And I don't feel like doing it even though the guests may be there. But one of the things that I found out is that a lot of times, even when you're in those moods, 
um, the guests will re-energize you or you'll get into the conversation and then you're like, you oh, wait a minute, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm on now and I'm awake now and then it'll change your mood. Because there have been some times in tune some interviews where I'm going like, I'm not prepared. I don't know who is anything about these guests. I'm not ready for this. And then the conversation will get into a groove. And sometimes it might even be in the middle because it's not always happening right at the beginning, but in some place you get in that groove and then you're like, hey, I can yeah. do this. And it's going the way that I want it to. But yeah, burnout is very real. And sometimes you have to uh, even take time to step away. So there is the step away moment. And there, is, there are sometimes folks that recognize the skill see the skills that you have and you know there are things that you have to watch out in that, that regards as well because while you want to do your best and you want to provide positivity and you want to give inspiration to people and you definitely want to give people a chance to speak their truth and their truth may not even always be your truth because you may be coming from a different perspective i mean i've had some conspiracy theorists and other folks on that i don't necessarily agree with what they said but i still want to give them the platform to share their thoughts and their opinions. It doesn't mean that I always agreed with them. But the other thing that you have to watch out for is that sometimes people can see your worth more than you can see your own worth. And when they see that, then you can run into the ha the bad habit of one, either not um, getting paid the compensation that you deserve. And that could be on anything from live stream producing to emceeing to a number of other things that you know they made and even the musicians and artists have to deal with this as well so you can get into that whole um yes i'm going to do it for the cause or i'm going to do it because i love doing it and not realizing that you still got to eat and you still got to pay your bills so that could be a very right. real conversation that we have to have with ourselves on a regular basis and there are don't get me wrong there are some folks out there that can recognize your talent and can definitely be um leeches and users and you also have to watch out for them as well because they will sit there and milk you for all that you are worth oh, yeah. and then mm -hmm. you're sitting there going like wait a minute what i did happened? i did 20 or 40 hours worth of work for you and i got paid you know a couple of hundred dollars and then you look at the bills and you look at what the worth was of what you did and you're like i probably should have got paid four thousand how come i only got paid 200 but then you're like mm -hmm. i was trying to look out for this person or that person but they recognize a lot of times people recognize your skill sets but they also recognize what they can get away with and they can only get away with what you allow them to get away with so sometimes you have to put your foot down and be like nah i know that you i, I know that you love what i'm doing i know that you love that i can do whatever this skill set is but at the end of the day you got to pay me just like you would pay somebody else. I know exactly. I was having this conversation with uh, some friends of mine that are musicians and we were thinking about how a lot of times musicians will be happy getting, you know, 50 to $100 a man on a gig, which is really not that much money if you think about it, particularly if they've got to travel and or go someplace where they're just, you know, um, happy or they're letting themselves get by. And then sometimes they don't even want to pay them that because um, you get some people to be like, don't you want to do it for exposure? And you're going like, um, no. <laughs> you ask, you ask your plum, do you ask your plumber or your car mechanic to fix your uh, plumbing or your car for exposure? I'm pretty sure he charges you. So if he's going to charge you, I should charge you as well, and you should be able to pay me whatever that going rate is because you know, I, I want the song that they sing to some of our creatives. I wish they would sing that song to their doctor or their lawyer or their um you know their plumber and i wonder how far they would go because i'm thinking like that you value right yeah exactly you know yeah. what i like that because um i need, need to hang around you a lot more yes and <laughs> so that i can get um a better understanding of something bigger because that's right. what i really want you know i want more um not just exposure but i i do want more experience and I think that would help greatly, not just me, but you, hopefully. <laughs> so, you know, we can all just kind of have our fun and do our thing and just be, you know, and that's yeah. what I want to do. And have and, and while we're having our fun, I, I'm pretty sure everybody else will have that fun, too, as well. Exactly. So, yes, because, like, we're goofy. I, I, I believe, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. The last video that we did... I messed up. I screwed up, you guys. I, um, I assumed. But in assuming technology, you can't do that. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so with that, you know, um, I messed up, but I mean, it was such a great conversation. You guys just had me here. Anyway, um, I'm telling you, like, I would love, you know, the opportunity to just <laughs> be your shadow. I want to oh, shadow, yes. you know, be your shadow and just learn, you know, what it is that it takes you know, to oh, really, yeah. really yeah. grow something organically and, you know, and just be more direct because, I mean, I'm a salesperson when it comes to it, but I'm used to selling a product. Right. Selling myself has been a little more difficult, but nevertheless, you know, it can I'm be like, difficult, but it can be difficult. But in the in reality, you are selling a product. You're selling the product of your brand, and your brand is part of what you are and everything. So it's uh, you know, who is Lady Maya? Who is Mark Lee? It's all part of a brand, and that what we're really selling is the brand and things along those lines. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, even to, even here in Durham, I have somewhat of a nickname that was given to me by one of my friends, I think Jillian, uh, no, Jillian Johnson was part of it, who is our mayor pro tem, but I think it was actually Juliet Jensen that came up with it, but they saw me involved and engaged in a lot of the community activities, like whether it's a festival, whether it's a parade, whether it was something like we have a thing called Centerfest, which is our annual street festival, or whether it was Full Frame, which is one of our movie festivals, or the um, Hey Ty, um Black Film Festival, or whether it's a number of other things that I've been engaged in for decades. So Juliet came up with the term, oh, he's like the Minister of Culture. So that's actually one of the nicknames that people will use and be like, there's Mark, he's the Minister of Culture. Say, say, Mark? <laughs> Minister of Culture? I love the it. Minister of Culture. Yes, that is a name that you'll find sometimes on Facebook and you'll find it in other places as well. Because then you know, I definitely have some running jokes even when we were doing the Eno Live, because we did the Eno as a hybrid event this year. So one day was live and the other days were recorded. Last year, the first year of the pandemic, it was all recorded. But And some of the events, like even the film festivals, Nevermore, I think will be the second or third year of being virtual. And definitely, I think the same for Full Frame. And this is my first year being a judge for Full Frame. It's my second or third year being a judge for Nevermore, which is like a horror fantasy type film festival and everything and last year even though it's not my lifestyle and i don't have anything against those with the lifestyle but i do love watching films of all sorts i got to judge um, for the first time out south which is a film festival dealing with the lgbtiqa and i literally called me on it because i forget all the letters because apparently if you have you have to put them in the order of the term quilt bag so if you put it all in it it can make the word quilt bags but it's a whole bunch of letters that all go together and there's the short version which is lgbtia which is the one that i think that i'm usually using i think that's the one i was using when malika like you left out some letters i'm like i did i didn't mean to leave them out because apparently there's like a lot of different types and everything but i have definitely been the judges on that and everything and that's always fun just getting to watch those films and you know make a judgment as to whether they're good or not and i can tell you there's some very bad films there's some very good films but there's some films that they're going like what the heck was the filmmaker thinking about and i'm sure the filmmaker was probably thinking the same thing as what was i thinking about when i judged it bad but mm -hmm. there were a couple of them i'm going like i don't get it like you know maybe it's just me i got a question for you and then i'm gonna mention one of the things that i did if if you submit to a film festival in the United States, because there was at least two films that did this. Mm -hmm. If you submitted to a film festival in the United States, right. and you're from another country, and you want to get accepted, don't you think you should at least put some sort of translation into the film? Absolutely. Because <laughs> there's at least two films that I'm sitting there, and they're, they're speaking in this language that I do not understand, and I'm going right. like, I have no idea what the film is about, because nope. I don't know what y'all are saying. <laughs> That's horrible. You, like they didn't get any type subtitles or nothing. No subtitles, no nothing. <laughs> oh, that's bad. What were they thinking? If they got picked up, they would get subtitles. <laughs> I'm hoping that's what they were thinking because I'm going like, where? I have no idea. I didn't speak Russian. My dad no. did take some Russian stuff when he was in the airports because I think he had to translate some stuff 
from like some of the Soviet countries as part of his job. And that was way back in the 60s, like the late 50s, early 60s. So I can tell you that in some 60 years, he never passed that on to me. So I have no idea what these people are talking about. I think there was another one that might have been in Spanish. And I should have done better in Spanish and or French when I was in college, but still did not make it there or anything. But the thing I was going to tell you that was that did not help at all. The thing I was going to tell you was somewhat unrelated, but was still just fun with some of the festivals. Like I said, I enjoy my festivals as well, is that for probably several decades now, maybe almost two decades, I have been the host of the Eno River Festival, which is at our state, one of our state parks here in North Carolina. And it's very, very much environmentally based, very much folk kind of music and blues and what people might consider roots music and definitely falls on the 4th of July, which of course is the nation's independence. So usually one of those days they'll bring the politicians and other people out and they'll do a celebration around the 4th of July. I decided 